morning, everyone. Welcome to the last day of the virtual third International Conference on Cordillera Studies. This is panel 27, Researching the Indigenous. My name is Karin Kojasi Bangsoy. I teach political science here at the University of the Philippines, Baguio, and I will be your moderator for this panel. With me as assistant moderator is Mark Neil Bagos of the Cordillera Studies Center, UP Baguio. We have four presentations for this panel covering diverse specific topics, but all discussing the very interesting general concept and questions of creating knowledge. Who creates knowledge and what's this knowledge for? This is especially interesting in the context of Indigenous peoples and our theme of sustainability, where the SDGs will definitely be unattainable without the proper knowledge to guide its implementation across its sectors and issue areas. So our panel this afternoon will proceed as follows. We will have the presentations of all panelists, followed by the time allotted to the audience for questions and open discussion. We remind the participants to send their questions through the chat feature. Questions may be sent at any time during the presentations, but they will only be discussed during the open forum. If you wish, you may also use the raise hand function to ask your questions directly to the panelists later. Uh, other reminders are now being shared on screen, I think. Um, but anyways, uh, please, keep those remind, uh, please keep those in mind as we continue with this panel. So let us begin our panel presentations on researching the indigenous. Our first speaker is Roselle Pineda. She is an educator, curator, dramaturg, researcher, community worker, and artist activist. She teaches at the Department of Art Studies, University of the Philippines, Diliman, and is the founder and curator of several nonprofit art formations, including the Performance Curators Initiatives, a network of performance creators in the Philippines, and the Aurora Artist Residency Program and Space, a community-based art or cultural collective in Dingalan, Aurora. She is currently enrolled in the PhD in Creative Arts Program at the University of Wollongong, New South Wales in Australia, doing research on collaborative art in Indigenous peoples' communities in the Philippines. The presentation of Mam Rosel Pineda is entitled, Merging Asynchronous Sounds into Synchronous Voices, Re-imaging, immersion, and gathering in the time of forced isolation. The case of the Adaw ni Dumagat, Dumagat Day, 2020 KKK Radio Program Festival. I begin here, where I stand in honor of the Darawal people who are the traditional custodians of this land. And I give honor to their people's elders past, present, and emerging. This is where I'm temporarily located in Wollongong, New South Wales, Australia, where the beautiful escarpments line the fine white beaches of the Wollongong coast before opening into the vast Pacific Ocean. This is also probably the longest that I have stayed here, as I could not travel at this time because of the pandemic, as my mind, heart, and all its other embodiments travel onto another edge of the Pacific Ocean, connected by this vastness to a place with a similar topography of beautiful rock formations and escarpments and the sound, the heat of the tropics. That served as home to my residency, my ARPS or Aurora Artist Residency Program and Space Art Collective, Research Area, and Creative Laboratory in Dingalan, Aurora Province in my homeland, the Philippines. The land that is also the ancestral domain of the Dumagat Indigenous Peoples, my community partner and creative collaborators, my family in so many ways. And it is in this that I want to honor the Dumagat are the traditional custodians of the land where I reside and create from. I also give honor to the indigenous peoples in the Philippines and around the world, whom I stand for, I stand with, and I stand together towards the struggle for ancestral lands right to self-determination and cultural pride. This research and creative journey had come a long way. 
from its preliminary query on the role of cultural research and cultural gatherings, such as the Dumagat Day Festival, in empowering communities. It had been challenged time after time that caused many and prolonged delays in the fulfillment of the project. From ethical considerations, militarization in our area, community conflicts, and so on and so forth. This project had been a test of community work's time-based and fluid framework in order to deal with these challenges. The lengthy ethics approval process was not the end of the challenge. When finally plans were underway to travel back to our area of research and plan for the Dumagat Day Festival 2020, COVID-19 happened and the world as we know it came to a halt. There have been many responses, philosophers, creatives, in urging us to use this pandemic as a stimulus to transform. Philosopher Bruno Latour calls this a dress rehearsal for what is to come. UOW scholar Sue Ballard and Kristen Erickson calls for working differently together in order to transform. Indeed, a global challenge to make this world a better place. In indigenous communities, the challenges that they were dealing with in their everyday lives, in their communities, poverty, deprivation of basic rights and social services, and being driven away from their ancestral lands brought about by climate crisis, development aggression and militarization continued on and even exacerbated during the pandemic. And on the 15th of April, 2020, despite the hardship of getting even a mobile signal in these remote communities and amidst total lockdown in the area. I received news from our Dumagat community that some of our community members, cultural leaders, and elders were sworn by the Philippine military as members and or supporters of the Armed Revolutionary Group, New People's Army or NPA, as part of their counterinsurgency program, Executive Order 070. This was when I decided to forget about canceling, forget about halting. And I, along with our Creative Arts Collective at the Aurora Artist Residency Program and Spacer ARPS, sent out audio and video messages of hope to boost the morale of our community partners, that we are with them even if we are not allowed to travel and physically be with them to our area. This was when I thought consciously and conceptually about the power of the voice and transmission as very important tools, not only in continuing communication with our community despite distance, but also as power, as real power to bring out the stories from these communities amidst lockdown amidst forced isolation, to respond to community needs despite no mobile or internet signal or any access at all. As a result, the Ado ni Dumaget or Dumagat Day Festival, Bente Bente KKK, Kwento, Kultura at Kalusugan Radio Program Festival was conceived. The radio program run from 9th of May to 20th of June 2020 and transmitted via the local radio station 102.9 FM Radio Kaedu, run by the local government of Dingalan. It was also aired via Facebook and also passed on as audio files to areas that were hard to reach, even through radio frequency. At dito nga tati na napagtanto na napakahalaga na magkaroon tayo ng isang piyesta ng mga tinig at piyesta ng mga tunog uh, sa pamamagitan nitong radio programa natin. In total, we aired six episodes that included segments on indigenous cultures, community health and empowerment, creative solidarities, 
community stories, COVID-19 related global and local news, and community meeting and or gathering locally called Pasorot Sorotan. I am still in Australia as I still could not travel and our community partner is still on another edge of this vast ocean. But the voice, my voice, their voices were certainly heard, certainly traveled, and were certainly transmitted. We heard the voice of the community, and our voices were certainly heard by them. And this is how we made each other felt, be present to one another, and transform and create another form of gathering, even in this forced isolation, even in this distance, even across this vast ocean. But this certainly more than that. This project also underscored the importance of creative impulse, the creative thinking because it allowed us to look elsewhere, to look for elsewhere when there is none. This is the challenge that matters. This is the creative impulse that matters. This is Rizal Pineda signing off. Thank you, Ma'am Pineda, for that examination on how our collaborative practices have changed and adapted during the pandemic and really the opening of new spaces and new voices to come forth. No? So thank you. Ang ganda po ng jingle na ginawa nyo. Our next paper is presented by two speakers, Ma'am Christine Glory Pusing and Mr. Frederick Delphine. Christine Pusing finished her degree in Bio, her undergraduate degree in biology in 2016 at the University of the Philippines, Baguio. She worked as a biologist in a private institution that focuses on cancer research and molecular medicine. Currently, she is the project development officer of the Filipino Genomes Research Program in the project Filipino Genomes, History, Evolution, Origins, and Applications at the DNA Analysis Laboratory Natural Sciences Re Research Institute of the University of the Philippines, Diliman. Mr. Frederick Delphin's undergraduate biology degree was also from the University of the Philippines, Baguio, and his uh, Master of Science degree from the Molecular Biology and Biotechnology Program, now the National Institute of Molecular Biology and Biotechnology of UP Diliman. His doctoral fellowship was through the International Max Planck Research School for Human Origins at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology, Leipzig, Germany, and through Leiden University Medical Center in the Netherlands. Mr. Delphin's research focuses on human population genetics, evolutionary genetics, and molecular anthropology. Mr. Delphin is the current program leader of a Filipino genomes research program at the DNA Analysis Laboratory of UP Diliman. Their presentation is entitled, A Filipino Genomes Research Program, representing the underrepresented in genomics research. Some of the figures and artworks are currently in the copyright process. We would like to ask not to take screenshots of slides with this icon. Thank you. Good day, everyone. I am Christine Glory Pussing, and today on behalf of my colleagues, I will be presenting a Filipino genomes research program representing the underrepresented in genomics research. But before we dive into it, let us first take a look at what the DNA is. As we all know, the human body is composed of organs that is then formed by tissues. 
These tissues are formed by numerous cells that have different specific functions, and these cells contain the nucleus where the genetic material is stored, which is called the DNA. The DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. It is an organic macromolecule which contains the basic instruction that a living being needs to live and function. Inside your DNA, there are molecular building blocks called nucleotides, each of which have been assigned one of four letters of the alphabet. We have A for adenine, T for thymine, C for cytosine, and G for guanine. Each person's unique DNA is what makes them different from everyone else, and the totality of this DNA is called the genome. The human genomics research have started in the 1980s wherein the Human Genomes Project, also known as the HGP, has provided the first view of what the human genome looks like in 2001. The HGP was responsible for the discovery of over a thousand disease genes, and in 2003, the International Haplotype Map Project followed as the next major development in human genome-wide survey of genetic variation. Up until its third phase in 2010, the HapMap was replaced by the 1000 Genomes Project. Both the HapMap and the 1KGP have been extensively used as reference panels by various genome-wide surveys of human genetic variation and genome-wide association studies. The use of samples that represent Africa, Europe, America, and Asia provided representation and thus general applicability at a worldwide continental scale. But despite their effectiveness, the HapMap and 1KGP are limited because they represented human populations at a continental scale. However, the Eurocentric nature of majority of these genomic studies does not make the results directly transferable or applicable to other populations not included in the studies. For better representation, there has been a wide call for the increase in representation of non-European and indigenous populations in genomic studies. This is why other genome research initiatives from around the world have followed suit. Some are already done and some are still ongoing. The DNA Analysis Laboratory, which is a component laboratory of the Natural Sciences Research Institute of the University of the Philippines, Diliman, together with the Department of Science and Technology, Philippine Council for Health Research and Development, we have responded to this call of representing the underrepresented by proposing a Filipino Genomes Research Program a human genomics research on the Filipino people by Filipino researchers and for the Filipino people. To give a brief background on the DNA analysis laboratory since its creation in 1996, it has three mandates. First is to engage in academic research to characterize the genetics of the Filipino people. Second is to pioneer the development of forensic genetics and research and extension services, and third, to establish population databases for forensics, ethnicity, and health. The DNA Analysis Laboratory was headed by Dr. Saturnina Halas from 1996 to 1998, followed by Dr. Maria Corazon de Uncria from 1999 to present. Since then, the lab has achieved a lot of milestones through the years. It has conducted researches such as developing sexual assault investigation kit in 2004, started expansion of the Philippine Reference Database in 2013, and officially started a Filipino Genomes Research Program in 2019. With these milestones achieved by the laboratory, we'd like to acknowledge the benefactors as well as local and international collaborators. 
Despite not being represented in the global initiative of genomics research, the Philippines have started conducting DNA-related studies. These are just some of the publications done by the DNA Analysis Laboratory over the years. The Filipino Genomes Research Program is a five-year program funded by the DOST Philippine Council for Health Research and Development. It is composed of three component projects, the project one called the Filipino Forensic Genomics, led by Ms. Jazlyn M. Salvador, project two entitled the Filipino Genomes History, Evolution, Origins, and Applications, led by Mr. Frederick Elfin, and project three, the Filipino Genome Region to help resolve child sexual abuse cases, led by Dr. Maria Corazon A. De Ungria. Only Project 1 and Project 2 will conduct a nationwide sampling to generate population genetics data set. The Project 3 will focus on the validation of the use of capillary electrophoresis and massive parallel sequencing technologies in handling DNA samples in sexual assault investigations. The phase one of the projects includes 17 regional centers from regions 1 to 13 and Mimaropa, CAR, BARM, and NCR. And we also have 24 ethno-linguistic groups included, four of which from CAR, nine groups from Mimaropa, five from BARM, and six from other regions. This is just phase one of the program. Other groups that were not included in the list can be proposed in the next phase. The program objectives are as follows. Generate a Filipino-specific DNA sample biobank and genome data bank, increase scientific workforce and expand research partnerships, document stakeholder appreciation of relevant concepts, and last, to represent and involve various Filipino groups in human genomics research. The FGRP employs an iterative, dynamic, and community-based participatory processes that can facilitate focused and long-term relationships between researchers and stakeholders. The program also follows a relevant research framework to ensure that the research process is ethical and abuses such as overinterpretation, stigma, discrimination can be addressed or avoided. The program also prioritizes appreciation for genuine free and prior informed consent or the FPIC and the participants are partners and owners of the DNA sample and data and the researchers are just custodians of the DNA samples to ensure that the research process looks out for the abuses and limitations our protocol has been reviewed by the University of the Philippines Manila Research Ethics Board. And to be able to implement the program accordingly, we have also worked with the various agencies and institutions nationwide. We have already started to forge partnerships with different colleges and state university colleges for the regional center group of and for ethno-linguistic groups of CAR, we have invited to collaborate the University of the Philippines, Baguio, particularly the College of Science and um, the Cordillera Study Center. Uh, following are just some of the other universities that we have already partnered with. And then the next step of the research process is the social preparation. As mentioned in the slides earlier, the research process follows an iterative and dynamic process where we coordinate and seek partnerships with LGUs, SUCs, NGOs, and community leaders. We also conduct meetings to inform and orient partner stakeholders and partner volunteers about the FGRP. We also engage with the target Filipino groups through social immersion to ensure their involvement in the free and prior informed consent process and lastly, call for community and individual consent to participate in the study. 
to aid in the iterative and dynamic process that we have employed and also as a tool used for sample collection, we have prepared a research communication and ethics instrument or the RCEI. The RCEI will be used to document input by partners, ethical, legal, and social implication measures, informed consent, and the outputs of the FGRP. The first version of the RCEI will be reviewed by partner institutions and then translated to the local vernacular producing the RCEI version 2. This version will be used in the recruitment and documenting the informed consent of partner volunteers. So, towards the end of the research process, a third version of the RCEI will be made where the partner stakeholder, partner volunteer informed final output and results of the study will be incorporated. From these groups for phase one, and for every Filipino group, 30 partner volunteers for Project 1 and 11 partner volunteers for Project 2 will be collected. Once consent was given by the partner volunteers, personal information, the biological sample which is the source of the DNA, um, anthropometric information, and genealogy will be collected from the participants. The next step is sample processing. COVID-19 measures are being followed in the sample collection and sample processing. The DNA extraction will be done in the University of the Philippines, Diliman, and the extracted DNA will be stored in the DNA Analysis Laboratory following all the relevant local and international ethical rules, policies, and laws. The DNA sequencing for Project 1 will be using a targeted type of sequencing, while Project 2 will focus more on the human whole genome sequence. After generating the sequence, different data analysis will be done, such that population-based analysis of different Filipino groups will be compared, and Filipino populations will then be compared to populations of other countries. Once the results are generated, a research validation must be done wherein the researchers must go back to the community and the cooperating agencies and discuss the findings with them. Their input will be considered in finalizing the study results. After validating the results from the community, the research will then proceed in the publication of the study. At the end of the study, all the partner volunteers' DNA samples and information will be stored in the DNA Biobank and Data Bank as a data resources for various disciplines such as health, medicine, history, and evolution, and of course, forensics. Beyond the study, the group may also propose a phase two wherein the remaining Filipino groups will be represented in a genomics research following the same research framework employed by the FGRP. Notably, the involvement and focus on Filipino groups will make genomics research relevant, transferable, and applicable to the Filipino population. There is a saying that if you're going to work with indigenous communities and genetics, you have to be willing to make lifelong relations. It is in this spirit that the FGRP will engage and involve different Filipino groups in Filipino genomics research. Of course, this is all possible through the help of our partner institutes and partner volunteers from all over the Philippines. So some are still ongoing, but um, so far this is uh, the list that we have already worked and talked with. With this, uh, we'd like to invite you to join us in writing our story and be able to represent the underrepresented in genomics research. Thank you so much. Again, on behalf of the FGRP team, thank you so much for listening and giving us your time. Thank you, presenters, for that interesting look at Filipino genomics research. 
and the involvement of different Filipino groups in writing this story. A reminder to our participants that you can send in your questions in the chat box at any time as the presentations are ongoing. You can also send them privately to myself or to our assistant moderator. Our third speaker is Eric Joyce Grande. He is an assistant professor at the Department of Humanities, College of Arts and Sciences, UP Los Baños, where he handles language and communica communication courses. He finished BA MassCom Journalism at, U at UP Baguio in 2001. In line with the K-12 transition period, he runs Knowledge Management for K-12, which seeks to support basic educations on emerging or growing research mandate, particularly in indigenous cultural communities in the Cordillera Administrative Region. He believes that while research management guidelines exist, indigenous or local knowledge traditions must be the base or scaffold of this mandate in the said areas. His presentation is entitled Knowledge Management for Basic Education's Growing Research Culture in Indigenous Cultural Communities. Good day, everyone. Uh, I'm Eric Joyce Grande of UP Los Baños. Uh, the title of this presentation is Knowledge Management for Basic Education's Research Culture in Indigenous Cultural Communities in Cordillera Administrative Region. Uh, my apologies for the slide. Uh, changes or modifications in the title of this presentation. Uh, here's the outline. And as a matter of introduction, uh, allow me to enumerate at least some uh, education policies uh, that have something to do with uh, research or what they call research mandate. Uh, these include Basic Education Governance Act of 2001, uh, basic Education Research Fund, Enhanced Basic Education of 2013, uh, Policy Development Process, Basic Education Research Agenda, uh, Research Management Guidelines, Philippine Professional Standards for Teachers, uh, and some others, which I already omitted uh, in the interest of time. Uh, Debt and Order 39 Series of 2016, for instance, uh, defines research culture as the regular exercise of systematic inquiry to improve program and policy development and implementation. So with this, um, I enumerate the objectives of this presentation. Uh, first is to present a context or to contextualize Deb Ed Carr's research culture. At least uh, for the last uh, 70 years, although it has a gap, uh, this is followed by an enumeration or characterization of the challenges confronting them or Deb Ed Carr constituents in terms of uh, doing research or knowledge construction for which an IKM model is uh, proposed. IKM stands for Indigenous Knowledge Management. So for the literature review, allow me to define what knowledge management is. Uh, it is essentially representation, organization, uh, acquisition, creation, use, and evolution of knowledge in many forms. So this can range from the traditional to the contemporary and emerging forms of knowledge. Uh, meanwhile, knowledge management research uh, searches for concepts, methods, and tools uh, that support the management of human knowledge. So this is essential, particularly in uh, indigenous knowledge. So for the methodology, uh, this study is fundamentally qualitative and in nature, and uh, it employs various methodological strategies just like uh, ethnography, ethnomethodology, and reflexivity. Uh, the sites, uh, include e school and districts and e schools division offices in Kalinga, Tabuk City, and Mountain Province. So I would like to report that I was able to directly work with the SDO Kalinga and SDO Tabuk City, while I only worked with a senior high school in Mountain Province. So participants uh, are basically deaf ed car constituents um they are school heads teachers and administrative personnel or staff um data collection 
took place within 2015 to around 2020. And I was able to accumulate a bibliography, uh, abstracts, and concept notes. Uh, and these were synthesized through frequency count. Um, I also accumulated field notes and letters. And these were subjected to discourse analysis uh, in order to develop an IKM model. So for the findings or highlights of um, this study, um, as regards the context of Deb Ed Carr's research culture, uh, we can actually actually glean something from an SIL bibliography of uh, or that was published way back. I, that was that covers uh, publications within 1953 to 2003. So out of 3,314 titles, 633 of which are about Cordillera, uh, 8 about Abra, 31 about Apoyao, 76 about Benguet, uh, 126 about Ifugao, 118 about Kalinga, and 274 about Mountain Province. So we can say Mountain Province was the research hub or the favorite research site at that time. Uh, moreover, I would also like to report that out of these 633 publications about uh, the Cordillera, 232 of which were undertaken with the Department of Education. So this suggests SIL and DepEd had some kind of research partnership uh, within this period of 50 years. Unfortunately, I was not able to account for 2004 all the way to 2015, all because uh, this study simply coincides with the full implementation of K-12 in 2016. So further, uh, for a broader appreciation of the region's research culture, uh, I also synthesized 8,536 abstracts from 15 research conferences within the last five years, or 2016 to 2020, 886 of which are about CAR, 5 Abra, 3 Apayao, 71 Benguet, 39 Ifugao, 34 Kalinga, and 34 also for Mountain Province. So evidently, Benguet has become the research hub. And I suppose this is because um, it has Baguio City being an educational center, not only in the region, but for the entire Amianan or North Luzon. Uh, using the same qualitative data set, uh, we can also infer or surmise the sources or the authors of such studies in order to figure out how many of these were produced or um, represented by DepEd constituents. So they're out of 886, 12 from DepEd, 6 from uh, a DepEd HEI partnership, 858 from HEI per se. So expectedly, they dominate the research discourse and eventually 10 uh, others, mainly from non-government organizations, uh, particularly research private uh, organizations or NGOs and faith communities. Um, I was also able to uh, collect 88 concept papers from the workshops from two divisions and one e school. Uh, I had a total of 88. And unfortunately, only one of these got uh, completed into a research report. Uh, and that is the reason why I also explored what could be the challenges uh, that get in the way of the ed car constituents when it comes to uh, research. And I found out four categories. One is logistical, and this has to do with the inaccessibility of print, uh, digital sources or materials, uh, which are very necessary in constituting uh, a proposal, particularly the literature review. Uh, the other category is linguistic. And this is something to do with the handicap in academic or technical writing. Uh, another category is legal. Um, and unfortunately, 
this points to a higher education institutions taking advantage of uh, graduate students from DepEd. Um, at least during the duration or at the time this con study was being conducted. And then the last is logical challenges. And this has to do with the dominance of posit the positivist paradigm uh, in doing research. So here's the emergent IKM model. Um, I call it Pan Nakigamulo, and I uh, elicited this local term, an iloco term for engagement, uh, from um, the conversations with uh, a, a focal person. So Pan Nakigamulo as an IKM model has four phases. Uh, I also indicated the iloco uh, counterpart it is because these are not just but faces but principles or notions and nuances of engagement or panagigamulo i also indicated the data or the archives mainly correspondences and then the outcomes of each and every phase or principle uh, so that this presentation will uh, appear realistic so first is connecting with knowledge so in iloco that is panakinaig so we connected with KM centers or departments, including university libraries and uh, individual donors whom we know uh, have a collection uh, which they can share. Uh, the outcomes include 850 titles uh, secured and uh, turned over to uh, the Provincial Library of Kalinga. Uh, we were able to secure more, but these have not yet been transported all because of the restraints due to global a global pandemic. Uh, the second phase or principle is constructing knowledge. In Iloco, this is Panang Buangay. So I kept in touch with DepEd Central Office, SDO Kalinga, SDO Tabuk City, and a senior high school partner in Mountain Province for academic reading and writing workshops. So this resulted in the third phase or principle, conveying knowledge or pandangipeksa. So in Iloco, this suggests um, uh, this suggests expressing something that has long been suppressed or long been kept uh, for a time now. Um, in line with this. We submitted our outputs to organizers of conferences and also publishers. So the outcomes include the following. And with this, I refer to the outcomes of the teacher participants in the workshops. So there were two co-authored presentations. That means I and a participant uh, co-authoring uh, a presentation. And then in the succeeding years, two of which are already independent or solely authored, independently or solely authored by a teacher participant, um, one of which is also presented at this conference, and that same output or outcome is now in press. So this suggests the um, uh, kind of mutualism that characterizes uh, research practice partnership. The last is consolidating knowledge or panang dagup. So I kept in touch with, uh, again, the SDO and the local government unit uh, for a facility that could consolidate uh, the collection and the outputs, however, uh, these are pending due to travel restraints and uh, the costly medical requirements, for instance, RT-PCR tests. So in the interest of time, uh, allow me to just gloss or show you the details of the IKM model. Uh, in particular, uh, the roles or the responsibilities of the researcher, for instance, HEI, uh, immersing in uh, a certain school and then the third column accounts or lists the responsibility or the roles of DepEd being uh, a partner and of course the last column has the roles of the community being the literal research site. So in conclusion, uh, Dep Ed Carr had engaged in uh, collaborative researches before the research mandate, uh, which was 
uh, formally uh, issued or uh, inducted in 2001. Uh, however, recently the research outputs are few. Um, and DepEd core constituents are, in fact, um, managing various challenges. And I guess uh, this got worse all because of the restrictions or restraints. And then lastly, uh, research practice partnership is recommended as a framework of uh, collaborative research. So these are my references, at least for this uh, presentation. And I say thank you for your kind attention. Uh, for questions and suggestions, you may uh, email me. Again, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Grande, for that discussion on knowledge management, particularly in the context of DepEd Cordillera. Our final presentation will be given by Grace Buenaventura. She received her bachelor's degree from the School of Library and Information Studies, UP, in 2010. She currently works with the UP Center for Ethnomusicology as its librarian. Apart from this official post, Grace serves as project coordinator for the UPCE publications and is managing editor of the center's annual peer-reviewed journal titled Musical Journal from 2012 up to the present. Grace is a recently elected member of the executive board of the UP Library Science Alumni Association and serves as its public relations officer. She is currently finishing her master's degree in the UP SLIS and is working on her graduate thesis involving the establishment of a community-based documentation and archive center in Hingyon, Ifugao. Ma'am Buenaventura's presentation is entitled The Community as Artists, as Researcher, as Archivist, Archiving for Cultural Sustainability. Good day, everyone. In lieu of the postponed archive and documentation uh, project in Ifugao, I will be discussing some of the activities and findings from my recently concluded LIS 290 special problem titled Establishing the St. Mary's Archive in Sagada, St. Mary's Arc, Phase 1, Collection, Inventory, Selection, and Storage. The special problem was referred to me by the UP Center for Ethnomusicology and was conducted as my final output for my master's degree in library and information science under the University of the Philippines School of Library and Information Studies. The UP Center for Ethnomusicology is a center for music research with an archive, library, and instrumentarium and audio conservation laboratory. It is engaged in digital archiving providing access to archive and library materials and field research. The UPCE acknowledges its situation at the forefront of preserving and transmitting the national identity expressed through intangible forms of traditional expression. Upon completing the digitization of its archive collections, the files were repatriated to the communities where they were recorded decades ago to be used however the community places. However, the center now acknowledges that work does not stop here. Among the recent and focused advocacies of the center is of true collaboration, where the community is seen as more than sources of information to be recorded, but also as masters of their own traditional knowledge, as project partners, and as collaborators in nation building and safeguarding of community identity. Cook des uh, Terry Cook describes identity as a concept that is asserted by many historians as shaped by common or shared collective memory animating invented traditions. He went on to say that identities are very fluid and contingent on time, space, and circumstances, and that it is, very, uh, it, it, it is ever being reinvented to suit the present, continually being reimagined. Another feature of identity is its construction out of difference. Rice stated that this feature is one point common to discussions of identity. This simply means that one's self-understanding is constituted by the construction of an other. Many studies of identity and identity construction have turned on concepts of difference and power. As archivists have joined the foray into identity politics, Schwartz and Koch describe how archives, as records, wield power over the shape and direction of historical scholarship, collective memory, and national identity over how we know ourselves as individuals, groups, and societies. 
ultimately in the pursuit of the professional responsibilities, archivists as keepers of archives wield power over those very records central to memory and identity formation through active management of records before they came to archives. Their appraisal and selection as archives and afterwards their constantly evolving description, preservation, and use. That is according to Schwartz and Cook. Sir Hilary Jenkinson, English archivist and theorist, outlined the central concepts in the profession. These are, there are three. Respect this fonts, original order, and provenance. All of these are geared towards the preservation of truth for the purpose of evidence, but in particular, two of them, respect the fonts and principle of provenance, are uh, di almost directly related to power and identity. Respective fonts is a principle in archival theory that proposes to group collections of archival records according to their fonts, fonts according to the entity that created or donated them. The principle of provenance means records that are created, accumulated, and or maintained by an individual organization must be represented together, separate and, in and distinguishable from the records of any other creator. Apparently, respect as fonts and provenance by nature also rely on the definition of identity and othering. This means that the archiving process in and of itself is heavily a political process, wherein every decision power comes into play. Working on the key concept of community, rather than taking records away from communities, the profession should empower communities to look after their own records through a partnering of professional archival expertise and the community's commitment and pride in their own heritage and identity. According to Flynn, Stevens, and Shepard, a community's custody over its archives and cultural heritage means power over what is to be preserved and what is to be destroyed, how it is to be described, and on what terms it is to be accessed. This allows the community to exercise more control over its representation and the construction of its collective and public memory. Okay. One of the opportunities for initiatives in community archiving presented itself in 2019 during the UPCE director's scheduled repatriation of field recordings in Sagada, the topic of archiving was discussed. It was proposed that since audio recordings of oral traditions, the old ones and the new ones, were already being repatriated to the community, perhaps it was time to build an archive. Establishing the St. Mary's Archive in Sagada, or simply St. Mary's Arch, is currently planned as a three-phased project which, in its entirety, aims to provide assistance through the transfer of basic know-hows as well as technical skills necessary for the establishment and operation of a community archive. The results and observations derived from the project phase are envisioned to help the development of methods for engaging communities and establishing community archives and documentation centers. So this is the whole flow of the, the whole framework flow of the three-phase project. Okay. St. Mary's Arc Phase 1 is the first phase of the project. It is focused on community engagement as well as technical skills transfer on the topics of collection inventory, selection, and storage and handling and labeling. The project phase was implemented in May 18, 2021 to June 1, 2021 through a total of five sessions. Four sessions of lecture and workshops on the topics of community archiving and basic organization and handling, and one final session which was dedicated to the presentation and validation of draft policies and procedures as well as the draft of the training manual. This series of lectures, workshops, and homework were given to the participants across all five sessions with the following specific objectives. The first one is, was to identify the participants' intentions for the establishing of the St. Mary's Community Archive. In particular, the objectives were to gain insight on how the participants define their community and their archive, identify the current resources available to the archive as well as other possible sources of support, identify the participants' goals and objectives for the archive, determine a working title for the archive and the volunteer team, and gain an understanding of how the participants envision their future archive. The second was to assist the participants in creating an inventory. In particular, it was to provide the participants example of how uh, the inventory can be performed. To assist the participants in creating an inventory form of their own, 
and assist the participants in filling out the, the inventory form. The third one was to define what material should be selected for inclusion in the archive. In particular, to inform the participants of the process of selection, to assist the participants in identifying what material should be included in the archival collection. Fourth was to identify guidelines on storage and handling, specifically to provide the participants best practices of storage and handling and to assist the participants in creating the archive's own guidelines on storage and handling. The fifth was to compile all participant outputs and articulate them into a manual of procedures for St. Mary's Arc, or at least the first parts of it. And then the last one was to evaluate and conduct trainings, uh, evaluate the conducted trainings and consolidate the training materials into a training manual for a community-based community archive. The project manager is Ms. Grace Benaventura, that's me, librarian of the University of the Philippines Center for Ethnomusicology, and a student of the University of the Philippines School of Library and Information Studies, currently taking up her master's degree at the time of implementation. Hopefully, graduate na ako ngayon. <laughs> the, the involvement of the PM was mainly managerial and logistic in nature. However, the PM also led some of the lecture workshops, especially those which were more technical in nature. The PM also acted as moderator during group discussions and liaised between the consultants and participants whenever feedback was given or if changes were requested. The project advisor was Professor Ira Benrostro Kabab, Associate Professor of the University of the Philippines School of Library and Information Studies. The project advisor was a source of counsel during the conduct of the whole project phase. Mr. Martin Julius Perez, Archivist of the Department of Foreign Affairs Archive, was the subject matter expert. The SME was mainly responsible for having the final word on what topics should be discussed, how workshops and activities should be carried out, and how output should be evaluated. Okay. In order to monitor and make necessary adjustments to the scope and content of each lecture workshop and its activities, debriefing meetings were conducted by the consultants after each session. The contents of the lecture workshop sessions were then changed according to the recommendations of the subject matter expert and the project advisor and then implemented. Okay. Let me go back one slide just to show how many participants we have. Okay. So the participants were composed of one project partner and five other volunteers, uh, three from the St. Mary School and two from the Church of the St. Mary Virgin. All of the participants are members of the community of Sagada. Okay. Prior to the conduct of lectures and workshop, the workshops, the participants were asked to review and sign consent forms. In the first part of the opening program, the consultants discussed the contents of the consent forms to make sure that everybody was on the same page and, and understood the implications of each item in the document. They were also constantly reminded that every session, in every session, that they are free to leave the sessions at any point in time without penalty if they are uncomfortable about being recorded and uh, or about sharing information. While the participants are the end users of the project technically because they are the ones who are going to use most of these materials, all of them are expected to contribute to the sessions and are therefore part of the team. The project partner was tasked with the responsibility of coordinating the other participants and making sure of their attendance. While all of the participants were responsible for attending the session, and providing all of the information that were needed in the deliverables. Some of the activities required the participants to act as researchers and, in, uh, and interview their fellow community members for feedback. Another activity was designed so that the participants could research materials and compile them creatively into, into their own individual archive plan. Many of these activities were collaborative ideas brainstormed by, uh, between the consultants. Okay, so as you can see from this table, there are lectures, and then there are workshop uh, homeworks, and then at the end, there are, there's a presentation and validation of policy and manual procedures, and as well as the presentation of valid and validation of the training manual. All of the responses derived from the activities were articulated by the consultants and added into a draft of policies and procedures for the future archive. The articulated responses were also derived to construct the following goals and objectives. Okay, so ito na yung 
na construct namin out of their responses. The primary goal of Tawid Chronicles, that was the running name of the archive chosen by the participants in one of the activities. Okay? The primary goal of Tawid Chronicles is to organize and preserve the archival materials and built heritages in St. Mary's School and the Church of the St. Mary Virgin and make them available for research by collecting and preserving materials that reflect the history, values, and way of life of the Sagada community. Specifically, its objectives, among others, are to become a hub of Sagada history and culture, where visitors and locals alike can have a full experience of old time and current Sagada through textual, photo, and audiovisual materials which accurately depict Sagada history. Exhibits of artifacts accompanied by local narratives, occasional events which will feature the performances, handicrafts, and other out artistic outlets of individual e Sagada. Next one is to collect and showcase materials which reflect important community values which are central to the community's identity, such as, but not limited to, these are the actual identified values of the community of the participants, Binadang, Obo, Ayaw, Ingenuity, and Harvard. The third is to be an institution which will act as a keeper of records of old traditions which are rapidly undergoing change due to modernization. And finally, to instill in the community the importance of keeping memories and traditions alive through the promotion of community archiving. Based on the accomplished objectives of the St. Mary's Arc Phase 1, the participants of the lecture workshops have acquired significant and uh, practical knowledge as well as the necessary tools in the inventorying, selection, storage, handling, and labeling of the current collection of the Tawid Chronicles Archive. The training modules were compiled into the preliminary parts of a training manual, which were turned over to the participants. The intention was for the Tawid Chronicles to have a training manual that they can use whenever they engage another uh, additional volunteers in their art. Perhaps due to a number of factors including limitation in time, face-to-face -face interaction among limitation in face-to-face -face interaction among the participants, and limited physical access to the actual materials in the collection, as well as online interface which caused difficulty in fostering a comfortable space for the sharing of ideas. One of the main concerns observed by the consultants was the difficulty experienced by, part by the participants in articulating and sharing their ideas with the group. This was especially apparent during the activity on the first session, May 18, 2021, where the participants were asked to have a group discussion in order to, follow, uh, to answer the following questions. Um, these are questions mainly to identify what were their intentions for wanting an archive. First was, what form of community archive do you want to create? Number two, what would be its purpose? Number three, what is the community, uh, is the community supportive of, of the idea? And number four, how do we engage the participants, of, uh, the participation of the other members of the community? Okay, so that particular activity, the project manager let them discuss among themselves and uh, I went away for a time. Me. The project manager observed that while she was away, a lot of ideas were being pitched by each individual member of the group. Uh, I could actually hear them speaking kankanae. I just catch some of the English words, so I know that they, they had a lot of ideas like donation boxes, concerts, exhibits. But most of these were not submitted in the final output. The outputs gathered from the participants reflected that they had plenty of background knowledge about archiving and surprisingly documentation contrary to how they think because they thought they had zero knowledge about archiving okay so however the reservedness of the participants continued on throughout the rest of the lecture workshop sessions with only around two of the participants apart from the project partner carrying the responsibility of speaking up in behalf of the others during post-session meetings of the consultants the following additional observations were made which may be um, additional causes of the participants uh, inhibitions and shyness number one Although they are the people currently taking care of the materials, the participants are not among the key persons in the community who have the capacity to make decisions. Number two, it seems that the participants have not yet thought about the bigger picture, the requirements in establishing an archive, such as where the archive will be based, where the budget will, be, will come from, what form of governance it will have, what processes, uh, what policies are needed, what potential support systems are accessible, and so forth. While the participants have an understanding of the dynamics between the St. Mary's School and the Church of the St. Mary Virgin, it is not yet clear to them how the local govern government unit and the DAPI, or the elders, um, so the LGU and the elders are the two institutions, the other two institutions aside from the church, who have a great influence on the decision-making in the community. So the participants are not yet clear 
how the LGA and the DAPI will play a part in the administration of the archive. And finally, since the participants were expecting only to receive the technical trainings on how to process the materials, like active preservation and digitization, the discussions on how to administer the archive and manage it might have been a bit overwhelming to them. Specifically focusing on the fourth observation, which was the most immediately apparent, the fourth was um, the part where the, where the participants were observed to be only expecting the technical uh, skills training and wasn't quite sure how to answer uh, questions regarding administration and management. Okay. So since this was apparent, the SME and the project, advi uh, project advisor proposed a number of revisions in the activities of the lecture workshops to cater to what the participants expect. Archival concepts were simplified and discussed to a minimum, focusing only on what the participants can use since appraisal as well as the creation of selection criteria. So these are um, archival, traditional archival and library management concepts. They're, they're, they could have been a little bit too technical for the participants. So the homework make a wish list was conducted in place of them. So flashed in your screen are the instructions for the Make-A-Wish homework. <laughs> okay. In a similar fashion, since not a lot of information was gathered on the intention of the participants for creating an archive, the homework Make a Dream Board was conducted. So this is uh, a homework where the participants were asked to gather photos, gather samples from other archives on how they envision the archive will be in the future or how they want to build the archive if they were to have first-hand uh, direct involvement in the building of it. Um, so, in addition, token prizes for the participants and consolation prizes for everyone who accomplished the homework were also provided to, provide, to motivate the participants and introduce some fun in the homework. The two activities proved to be successful in helping the participants describe the materials, values, and features of the community that they want to include in the archive. The participants seemed to have a to have had a lot of fun involving their family, friends, and colleagues in making the wish list, and they were especially keen on expressing their activity and in designing their version of Tawi Chronicles through their dream boards. While half of the participants seemed to already feel comfortable presenting their ideas with the group, some of the participants held on to their shyness, which persisted during the fourth session. Some can be heard giving their explanation of their contributions in the storage and handling guidelines in the background, needing to be echoed by to the uh, needing to be echoed to the project manager so that I can hear by by the more per, uh, confident participants. Despite the persisting shyness and uncertainty of the participants, it was observed that the participants felt a happy sense of accomplishment upon closing of the project. The participants were especially generous in, in congratulating each other during the presentation of each homework as well as during the awarding of certificates to the winners. The conduct of St. Mary's Art Phase 1 was a success based on the accomplished objectives. However, the biggest concern that remains unresolved is the participants' tasks of identifying resources as well as uh, defining their own goals and objectives. Going forward, the participants should, should and join other members of the community, especially those who have the capacity to make decisions, in identifying these following resources required, for, uh, required in the archive. So these are governance structures, human resources, community engagement, collaboration, and participation, policies and institutional support, assets and financial resource, and risk management. Because these are the elements that will make sure that their archive will run and operate in a sustainable manner. Okay, as more community archives and documentation projects are now being conducted in partnership with local communities, it is the task of archiving and documentation professionals to make the community understand that archiving is not confined to preserving and digitizing materials and being done once the task is accomplished. Nor is it a project that should simply be consigned to an archivist to be worked on for a period of time until it is completed. It is important for the community to realize that since the archive is a reflection of their identity, passing on the archive to the next generation is similar to passing on the community identity. Since a community identity is fluid and dynamic as we have dis uh, discussed before, as we have defined it, community engagement should be conducted in a regular basis. Identification is a process that never 
that is never completed and is always in process according to Holland to Gay 2012. Therefore, community engagement and community archiving should also be continuous. Community engagement is the key to successfully empowering the participants and determining what the participants want for their own community archive. The rest of how the technical processes will be conducted should follow based on findings from the community engagement activities. As the UP Center for Ethnomusicology envisions itself as a partner in empowering the community to be the primary researchers, archivists, and curators of their own culture, its role as mentor should not stop at transferring required skills and technology and providing logistical support. The more difficult task of the archiving professional now is to establish a long-standing relationship of engaging and empowering communities and building their capacity to sustainably manage their own archives. Okay, these are my references and that's it for my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ma'am Buenaventura, for rounding out our panel by looking at the active participation of the community in archiving. So we now move on to our Q&A section. And while the questions are coming in, we have a few already may just summarize very quickly our discussion thus far. So our panel this morning has revolved largely around the following implicit questions. Now, who creates knowledge? Who owns it? How is it created? And what is it for? Across many different topics and issue areas. So from creative partnership for a radio program to Filipino genome research, to research in basic education, and to community archiving. So our first presenter highlighted the Dumagats as community partners and collaborators in a creative radio program that highlighted voices as power, created immersion and gathering, and amplified the stories of the community. On the flip side, you know, in, natural, in the natural sciences world, our second presenter uh, showed us how IPs are now being involved in DNA research in the Philippines, where they are active participants, they are owners, and the researchers are just the custodians of the genome data. And therefore, there has to be a research design you know, that supports lifelong relations with these groups. Our third speaker, uh, discuss the research culture in the Ed Cordillera and the challenges that confront this research culture and showed us you know, an emerging indigenous knowledge model that can help with managing the creation of knowledge and the, the this, this dissemination of knowledge in the region. And lastly, our, uh, last our last presentation discussed true collaboration where the community are project partners in archiving and the importance and emphasis on identity in the political archiving process where the community has control or power over its own archives and therefore power over the creation of its own identity and continuing memory for the community. And it was demonstrated uh, in Sagada, the St. Mary's archive. And so research, as we can see here, is essential in the context of indigenous peoples and our theme of sustainability. Again, the SDGs will definitely not be attainable without proper knowledge to guide their implementation. No, but in the creation of this knowledge, as we have seen in the presentations, things like ethics, power relations, research and project design, community partnership and knowledge ownership, and the challenges in creating this research. Now, these all need to be taken into account. So we have a very interesting lineup of speakers. And thank you to all our panelists. Um, when we now call on uh, you to be ready for the questions, we have one for the second presentation. So Ma'am Christine Pusing and uh, Mr. Frederick Delphine from Madison Munar in the chat box. Good morning. I would like to ask on the results, highlights, published or unpublished from the Filipino Genome Research Project. Hi, good morning. Um, hi, Sir Mads. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, actually, the Filipino Genomes Research Program um, started in 2019. And um, since then, we have started the procurement of the necessary equipment, um, materials for the program, as well as the initial um, communication with our partner institutes. Um, since the pandemic happened, um, we were supposed to collect um, or recruit um, partners, partner volunteers in 2020, but then the pandemic happened. So uh, our collection has been postponed. Um, but we already have 12 Filipino groups that are currently being sam uh, sequenced and um, we have an ongoing data generation for those groups and we are also in the process of um, recruiting uh, NCR population. Um, for the car, I haven't started yet with the recruitment. We are still discussing um, with um, 
the College of Science in the UP Baguio. So um, we still have to um, talk more for the um, implementation of the program in the Cordilleras. So, uh, so far that's for the um, result of the project as of the moment. Thank hey, you. thank you. Uh, so we have an anonymous question and this is directed to all panelists. Good morning to all panelists po and thank you for your presentations. What are your thoughts on how we can assert the importance of research, especially collaborative research in a context where this is not really valued or where there are many real world crises that demand our attention and energy? So um, anyone can start po? Maybe we can start from the first presenter, Ma'am Rosel. Uh, magandang umaga sa lahat. Uh, hindi ko, hindi, is it devaluated research? I mean, I think what's the question, um, I think the question relies more on the idea of where this research is conducted. Kasi dapat natin i-recognize na hindi lang naman research ay academic endeavor. So there are many, many, many platforms of research also. So I'm not sure if... Um, I'd want to answer directly on the idea that research is devaluated. It's more like we have to diversify also different platforms of research, different um, uh, methodologies. I think one of the things, for example, that in the humanities we're fighting for is, um, uh, uh, you know, sinabi kanina ni Sir uh, Joyce Grande, I think, you know, yung, yung dominance ng positivist research, for example. And, and sa humanities, medyo talagang ano yan, uh, we're trying to, to um, uh, not only decolonize, you know, yung idea natin ng, ng uh, research that is based on, especially in the academy, academy is so guilty of that, you know, na na kailangan may framework muna, ganyan, or whatever. In, in, the, in humanities, that's so hard to, to also implement, especially in community collaborations. So I think more than the idea of research has devaluate, devaluated, I think we have to address it in terms of thinking about research in different platforms, in different methodologies, in different perspectives also. So... Um, for example, sa amin, art as research is very important uh, framework. Practice-led research is very important framework. Uh, when you when you perform, when you actually you know do something you know in relation to community, in relation to time, space, and as new materialists said, the inclusion of the researcher not only as the agency but all non-humans alike, you know, including oceans, atmospheres, you know, all these things are very, are kind of uh, new ways of looking at how we think about production, knowledge production. So um, does that make sense? I didn't answer it directly, <laughs> but I think that's an important case to put forward, you know, in terms of how we view research um, in all fields, including the sciences, um, community work, and, and humanities and the arts. Right. Thank, Thank you, you Thank you. I really appreciate that uh, you emphasize the multiple perspectives because our panel, I think, is uh, evidence of this uh, different perspectives all coming together on the topic of oh. research. <laughs> oh, oh. Ako ka parang, aha, just pa napaka diverse. And it's exciting as well. And hi, Grace. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, can we ask any of our uh, other panelists if you have any other thoughts on that question? How can we, you know, uh, work towards more collaborative research, more valued research, more different kinds of research? Any thoughts po from the various fields represented on this panel? Perhaps see uh, Sir Grande might have something okay. to say about this. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, I agree with the input of Ma'am uh, Ma Rosalie. Um, that is, research should be uh, perceived or approached not only as a matter of academic research, but from the more overarching concept or notion of knowledge production. Um, in line with the ongoing education uh, reform in the Philippines, uh, I would like to report that the education system is actually and ideally hinged on what we call knowledge-based, knowledge-driven education. And that is the reason why uh, 
we really cannot run away from research or knowledge production uh, in general. But to address uh, that idea of devalued uh, notion or devaluation of research for that matter, uh, one very practical uh, step that we can undertake as researchers is uh, for us to go back to the indigenous notions of knowledge. Uh, in my other presentations, I was able to uh, elicit um, indigenous notions and at the same time practices of, of knowledge. And unfortunately, these have been obscured simply because they have been so natural. They have been so uh, innate and inherent that um, students, teachers, and other practitioners for that matter would only look up to academic research as the blueprint or as the, the yardstick or the benchmark. So it is very, um, well, if I may say uh, instructive that we go back to indigenous notions of knowledge. And uh, we may be able to achieve that uh, through ethnomethodology. Um, so from the indigenous notions of, um, from, from the indigenous uh, conceptualizations, uh, we may actually develop frameworks uh, through which we can make sense of the realities or the phenomena uh, which we are investigating or examining. Thank you for that, sir. And I agree with really those indigenous uh, concepts, no indigenous methods. And perhaps we can ask some input from Mam Ma Grace on how uh, the community sh uh, showed this or how displayed out sa community archiving and you know how how they value this community archiving. You know, in a world na. Uh, we're questioning actually the value of research, if it's really valuable. Hi, sorry. Did you, uh, what, was I supposed to answer the question? Uh, the uh, question yes, from uh, the panel any, or... any, any input from uh, your end, from your viewpoint of community archiving? Okay, yeah. Um, actually, I made a face when I heard the question because uh, I was uncertain if, if research is being undervalued. Maybe there is difficulty uh, with regards to support. Uh, gaining support for your research, but this question has been asked in many different conferences. How do we gain support for our research? If you if your research is valuable, um, it's not really about um, finding or making your research appear valuable to a lot of people. It's really about finding your niche. So that has always been the answer. If your research is valuable, there will always be a niche to support it. So I, I am also dodging, kind of dodging, or I don't have a direct answer to the question. Um, and with regards to input on the... Uh, I'm sorry, what was your question, Miss Miss Karen? Uh, no, I'm just trying to connect po sa sinabi po ni Sir Granden the uh, highlighting com uh, community and indigenous concepts of knowledge. And I think that really came out po sa presentation nyo about community archiving. So obviously, these are valuable, no? apart from yes. yung academic value placed on research, but the indigenous concepts themselves are very valuable. And I think that really came out po sa community archiving nyo. Yes, actually, um, from my experience, it was difficult at first to... to um, to make that apparent because apparently um, the, commu the the participants themselves, uh, well, they know that we are, we as outsiders were interested about their culture. But when we um, threw the question back at them, like, what do you value about your community? It was at first difficult to draw out the answer from them. Uh, at first they were like, uh, it was like they were giving us answers that they think were were the answers that we wanted but you know um for the archive to run sustainably they have to know they have to put the value on their material so we have to we had to really draw it out from them we had to revise our our methodologies so it starts from there i think um the valuing we, we as uh, I'm external to, to Sagada, so I can only speak for myself. I can't put the value on on their materials, their knowledge, so they have to be able to articulate it by themselves. So that's what I can say about that. Hi, hi also, Ma'am Rosel. <laughs> May I interject in that? I think that's also where the problem of research lies, eh? Because 
meron ka talaga when you go kaya nga sinabi ni Linda to Hewai Smith one of the most uh, popular decolonial theories no that research actually in indigenous communities are deemed di dirty because when you go to the communities you already have certain frameworks certain ethical standards certain you know that that you apply to the community and hence you get what Grace was actually saying you know that you you have to draw you have to you know that becomes really the the um, the thing that that you know that that evokes conflict also in terms of what we deem as research what we think as research methodologies and what the community is actually doing so kaya hindi kaya hindi ko gets ko naman yung question na parang there's an undervaluation of research in general pero mas pa gusto nating pag-usapan yung complexity ng iba ibang mga forma at paraan ng pagsasaliksik eh. um, so so i think you know especially in the academe this has always been kind of uh, you know parang batbatan talaga yan no kung ano ba ang ibig sabihin ng pananaliksik and where do you publish it you know when i do research i don't necessarily want to publish you know it's it's a <laughs> It's a it's a it's a very different track also sometimes when you're working with with um practice based and practice led research as with collaborations with communities. So and yung expectations sa atin lalo na kapag meron kang grant funding, hindi ba? So uh, there's all these players working eh. and, and 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 it's also a matter of navigating uh, um, all these players and where do you stand where do you you know so um, I will extend what Grace was saying a while ago that identity is not the only fluid when it comes to research with communities but also the positionality of the researcher is fluid you know when you work with communities sometimes bigla kang nagiging legal counsel tapos artist ka naman yung mga gano, yung mga, but what do you do you know so there's always this kind of careful because you have the ethical stance but also it's always a constant navigation and negotiation uh, when it comes to um, collaborative research it's very complex it's also kind of messy in that sense you know so ayun, sorry <laughs> like no, no, thank you thank you for so much for that mom and just to close out perhaps we can hear from mom christine how this looks like sa natural science research the genome research now that interaction and collaboration with the community and for that kind of knowledge um actually yes we do recognize that there is uh this parang um uh not necessarily a problem, but a challenge on how to do research, um, especially with dealing with um, communities. So for our program, um, what we would like to emphasize more is more on the participation and genuine appreciation of the participants themselves. So um, like what Mom Grace said, that if um, they know the value or they, they um, parang hinugot nila yung value from themselves, you will not force them to like the project or the research that you're actually doing. So I think that's one of the um, uh, one researcher that should also um, um, give attention to uh, uh, more on the appreciation of the partner volunteers, not just on the um, goal of the project to get the samples, but more of for them to appreciate what is the significance of the study that you are actually doing. And also, we all, um, I would like to um, point out that, um, like for our program, we do validation reports. So after generating the uh, results, we must um, go back to the com community so that um, we can report back the result to them. Uh, and if they don't agree with the result that we have generated, then we must um, comply with whatever they wanted to do with their um, data. So uh, that's one thing that researchers um, should also consider when doing research with the communities if they're going if um, the researchers values the um, points and um, perspectives of their uh, partner volunteers. 
Okay, thank you very much to all our panelists. And unfortunately, no, we are out of time for our panel this morning. Sa isang isang tanong lang, pero napaka complex na po yung naging discussion natin no, in researching the indigenous. So again, thank you very much to our panelists. We hope that this discussion no will contribute towards privileging community knowledge and indigenous knowledge as valuable and integral to the achievement of sustainability. Our theme across multiple sectors and issue areas. Mm -hmm.